victory over a dread disease. When Jonas Salk developed the polio vaccine, the Salk vaccine against crippling polio proved to be a sensational success. He famously opposed the idea of patenting and profiting off the discovery. They weren't in this for making money, it just didn't interest him. Today, patents and profits have become central to the development of innovative drugs. Without patents, companies wouldn't have the incentive to bring a medicine to market. But with skyrocketing drug prices making headlines... In recent months, the price shot up almost 5,000%. They're priced disastrously and almost criminally too high. Has the system designed to bring innovative drugs to market shortchanged the very people it's supposed to help? I think the public is not aware of all the stuff that goes on. It's not right. It's not fair. When the polio vaccine was rolled out in 1955, Dr. Jonas Salk, the scientist who developed the drug with funding from the March of Dimes, became an overnight celebrity. And the entire world heralded the discovery which assured an end to one of mankind's most dread diseases. Following that, um, Ed Murrow, who had a television program, interviewed my father, and one of the questions she asked was, who was the patent on this vaccine? Well, the people, I, I would say, there is no patent. If you look at the original tape of that interview, there's a moment where there's sort of a little bit of, uh, of pausing. And he thought for a moment, and then you could see the expression on his face just, just light up. He said, could you patent the sun? <laughs> he just saw this as, a, you know, this was just a, a natural evolution of science. The results belonged to, to the people. Well, that's the way it was in those days. Scientists had the view that you could either do well or do good, but that it was tough to do both. AIDS is the most serious epidemic to strike this country since the polio epidemic of the 1950s. By the time another public health crisis hit America, three decades later... The often deadly disease was unknown five years ago. Doctors now say it's a national epidemic. The pharmaceutical industry had changed dramatically. The costs of research and development had soared, and drug development, with expensive clinical trials, had become increasingly reliant on investment. Jonas Salk was interested in trying to develop an AIDS vaccine when he was approached by a venture capitalist and asked to collaborate and form a biotech company. My job was to finance the company. To start on an ambitious effort like the one we did with Dr. Salk, to get the best people working on this, you need to give them the opportunity that this is not just going to be a puff of smoke or a tumbleweed that's just going to blow away. Salk began to experiment with a vaccine using the AIDS virus itself. Patents are fundamental to that process. This was not a charity. And so, Jonas Salk's company ended up filing several patents on a potential AIDS vaccine. It's not what my father would have chosen. Different world a different reality. Today, the pharmaceutical industry has evolved into a trillion dollar business. It's clear any for-profit company has to answer to both investors and it has to answer in our case to patients as well. In 2004, Barbara Heiser was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer called chronic myeloid leukemia. When my oncologist told me what the diagnosis was, my first question to him was, how long am I gonna live? And he said, up until about three years ago, you would have, had, would have had three to five years to live. But he said, now we have this new drug. And he said, you're not going to die from leukemia. Gleevec has been hailed as a real-life cancer-fighting miracle. But this pharmaceutical marvel has a drawback that is becoming increasingly important in the worsening economy. Gleevec had a list price of around $26,000 a year when the drug came on the market in 2001. Heiser was getting a deep discount from the manufacturer, Novartis. But in 2012, after she changed insurance companies, her costs went up. So I called to renew my drugs, and the operator said, I'm going to charge your credit card $5,000. And I said, what? At that time, I said to my husband, I said, you know, it, I feel like I'm being faced with the choice of either keep our house and keep the lifestyle that we have 
or stay on Gleevec. We couldn't do both. Today, the price of the drug can run to more than $100,000 a year, earning Novartis around $4.7 billion in sales in 2015. Heiser says the price is outrageous, especially considering that some of the cost of researching and developing Gleevec was paid for with federal funds. When my money goes to help fund the development of it, and then they're going to turn around and charge me exorbitant prices that I can't afford, then there's something wrong with that. I think it's important to look at the advancements that we've gotten and ask whether or not those advancements would have occurred without a for-profit for industry. But over the past few decades, innovative drugs have increasingly stemmed from federally funded research. That's because of a little-known law called the Bayh-Dole Act. This law changed everything. This 1980 law allowed researchers who made discoveries funded by public institutions, like the National Institutes of Health, to license their patents to private companies who could develop and market new drugs. Despite the fact that America was investing a significant amount in research and development dollars, only 5% of patents were ever getting used by the private sector because there was uncertainty around those patents. What the Bayh-Dole Act really did was cause a transformation in terms of the ability of the private sector to utilize that research in the hopes of bringing a new product to market. That one law said to the big drug companies, you can market drugs, but you don't have to come up with your own original innovative drugs. That will be done with NIH dollars. And that's exactly what has happened. But do they have a right to be rewarded as though they were the innovators? And she says, the problem with pharmaceutical pricing today extends beyond drugs. A growing firestorm over the soaring cost of potentially life-saving EpiPens. The price of EpiPens has skyrocketed. Mylan Pharmaceuticals licenses the patent on EpiPen, a special syringe whose precursor was originally developed with public funds at the Department of Defense that injects epinephrine or adrenaline to treat life-threatening allergic reactions. Over 10 years, the EpiPen has gone from $100 to $600. The drug itself isn't expensive. It's the delivery method, which is. So Jim Duran led a team at King County Emergency Medical Services that developed a less expensive way of administering the drug. It would only take about $10 worth of equipment, plus $5 worth of epinephrine to put a package together. We developed a kit, uh, what we call the check and inject kit. So inside the kit, we have our little check sheet, two safety syringes, and then your bottle of uh, adrenaline. King County's emergency services are saving more than $300,000 a year with this alternative kit. And emergency services around the country are now buying kits or learning how to make their own as an alternative to Mylan's EpiPen. We are going to continue to run a business, and we're going to continue to meet the supply and demand of what's out there. The complaints against high prices have risen. It's not funny, Mr. Cirelli. People are dying, and they're getting sicker and sicker particularly with some drug companies making record profit margins. We've seen these prices creep up and up every single year uh, for so many drugs. And some have pointed to another provision of that 1980 Bayh-Dole law, which allows federal authorities to march in and take over the patent of a publicly funded drug in extenuating circumstances. The Bayh-Dole Act says the patent has to be made available to the public on reasonable terms. If the patent, drug or whatever else it was, uh, wasn't sold at a reasonable price to the public, the government could march in and lower the price. There's no history at all that it was intended to address drug prices. I would argue that if march-in rights are used to address drug prices and the government could come in and, and either give license to someone else or try and control the price, it would undo the positive influence and the positive aspects of the Bayh-Dole Act. The NIH has declined to use the march-in rule for drug pricing despite six petitions to apply it to high-priced drugs for such diseases as AIDS and cancer. Barbara Heiser says she is not waiting for the government to solve her drug price problem. I'll be honest with you, the drug that I take has a generic that comes out of India, but that generic is not legal in this country. Since the Indian version costs a small fraction of the drug price in the U.S., Barbara has started ordering her pills directly. 
when I get my my shipment, I almost feel like I'm looking over my shoulder to open it up. I feel like a law-abiding citizen has become a drug importer, and that doesn't feel very good. But she says she risks it, since it's the only way she could afford her life-saving medication. If I were doing it the traditional route, I would pay $1,300 out of pocket. Going through India comes to about $250 for a month's worth. We have to remember that there are people on the other end of this and that we not end up depriving people of life-saving medications. The reasons that I can't get it as a reasonable price from my neighborhood drugstore are all political, and that stuff needs to be fixed. There was a phrase that my father used, which is more important, the human value of the dollar or the dollar value of the human? Somehow in this complex world, we have to find a mix between the two.